consecrated life for me means, uh, as a young woman when I first entered, it meant I wanted to do something beautiful with my life and this was a way I could give myself to God and to the country because consecration to God also means consecration to the world. If my life is lived out um, as a gift received and a gift given to the world for, the, for, for goodness, for beauty, for truth, for love. We are all called, but those who become consecrated are the ones who take the three vows, vow of poverty, of obedience and chastity, those three vows. So it means not necessarily that we are destitute. We are not destitute. People look at us and say, but you have, you know, you have a meal, you have a car, but they don't realize that these things are for the common use. And then we talk about obedience. We are where we are, not because we choose to be there, but we have been asked to go there in obedience. God, yes, is the one that we obey through the leaders of the congregation. And we take the vow of chastity, meaning we don't get married, we don't have children, you know, and we strive to live pure lives. Men and women do not bind, con commit themselves to another human being, to parenthood. They commit themselves mostly to live in a community to a very intense relationship with God for us. And so in the church we call it religious life a particular life form. Marriage is a life form. And that life form, as it has evolved over 2,000 years, finds people like Sister Anne, myself, some of the other sisters, living in community with a strong prayer life, connection to the divine. We're supposed to be contemplatives in action. To be a woman in the Catholic, it is, I think that it is it's quite difficult even today, I think, because at present, we think like now, when it comes to priesthood, the main, it is the hierarchy, we call it the hierarchy. So, is mostly their men, his pope, cardinals, and all and all. But the women, like now, even with the sisters, I would say, in the church, is a, it, it, it is a difficult, really. The role of women in the church is not yet what we hope it should be. We don't need to do the same thing that the priests are doing. We have our own place, our own space, and we have much more to do in the communities. Being a woman, I think we are more close to the people than a man. Uh, if you go into the house, if you go into a building, you want to meet the people as a woman, you do much easier than a man. And I think we are much more close to those people really are in need from different communities. There are days that priests cannot go here or that he has to say mass, he has his own responsibilities to also to do, but not, for us, not depending on them, we can do much more. Women are generally still trying to get to the position where they have equal rights, or not equal rights, but equal entry into various levels of society. And I'd say in, in the church, I do, yes, sisters have a voice, but they could have a better voice, I think. And they have a lot to say, and they're very well informed. And I think they should be maybe given more freedom to do what they want to do, how they want to do. We're all very different. The only thing we have in common, the only thing I have in common with any other sister is that she is trying to follow God's call. The difference isn't to be endured. It's a gift that enriches me. It helps me. And God speaks through that diversity, calls something out of me. We are one and for one 
purpose God created us for one one reason. We have we are here for a reason, all of us. So we are to take our missions and be responsible. Even when he talks about the, the, the religious, we are we may have different charisms, but we are one for one mission, following one Christ. Pope Francis is another character, so to speak. I, I don't know what better way to describe him with. But sure, with his coming in, he's bringing in the freshness, the fresh air that the church really needed. Others might see him as being controversial. Others might see him as being too relaxed, maybe, in that he's uh, bringing in things which our most conservative um, counterparts might, you know, find a bit uncomfortable uh, to deal with. However, he's brought a lot of change into, um, into the church. Pope Francis, I think he's a, he's a very dear person. He, he's not uh, tied by too many, con, you know, constricts, if you like. He's prepared to listen to, he's prepared to be, to go with the, with the thinking of this age, because I think that's what we need to do. We can't just keep an old thinking and say everything is wrong today. Just go with it and see how to, to uh, help it to develop to its capa best capacity. Pope Francis meant uh, looking at what the work the missionaries have done. Like as an African, I can look back at their work and be very angry that they colonized, they colonized us. And you know they have got us into Christianity by force, and sometimes some of the things that they are doing are not Christian really. But what he is saying is, despite everything else, despite the bad things maybe that we still hold about what what happened, what the church did in the past, we must look back. At the, what the missionary work with gratitude because we are where we are because we are standing on their shoulders. Pope Francis is very much a Pope for the people and a man who makes significant small gestures which show that he's there for everybody. It's small acts that are going to bring hope and unity in our world and the more of us who try to do that I think the more it'll happen and Pope Francis is calling us to really live what we believe. I believe that all humans want goodness, truth, beauty and love. The Pope Francis call is always for the poor. Stand with the poor. It, it, no matter how uh, uh, wretched or how uh, poor that person is, it's very important to Pope Francis. And it's calling us to wake up from our slumber to come out of our closet and to see the people who are begging and lamenting for their lives to be improved in our world. And for me, reaching out to these children, to the sick within my community, is one of the many ways that Pope Francis is calling us to open our eyes and to see the people who are in need of our services and to be able to reach out to them with joy and to be grateful that I am able to contribute to that bigger picture. Pope Francis is where his feet are on the ground. They are not anywhere else, but he has his own way of evangelizing. And the most beautiful thing that is happening is that 
quite a number of people who are not even Catholics admire him. I think Pope Francis' key word is mercy. And I think that is in everything he's bringing it to. He's, he's bringing forward that mercy, whether it's mercy towards the whole of creation, whether it's mercy towards each other. Um, I think that for me has been the most moving thing. We are called by God, sent by God to through the world, but in especially places where we have migrants, refugees, returnees, people on the move. So we work more in, in those areas where there is a lot of vulnerability that needs our help. They are there to welcome. Everybody that works for the mission welcomes the most vulnerable people, women and children, who arrive with nothing. Sometimes just a plastic bag. Um, they've had nowhere to sleep. They've had no food for days. The children often come sick. And to welcome somebody with open arms, that, that is what Bienvenue Shelter is about. I'm from Congo DRC. I arrived to South Africa in 2002. I was so miserable. I see a big town where I know no one. I have no food, no place to go, and I was having a little baby, then I came here. Our criteria normally is up to a three-month period. People who have come from war-torn countries, victims of torture, they're never going to be okay after three months. It might just take them three months to actually get to trust, to build up that relationship with someone. Um, more of our longer-term cases are those torture cases, and they can be with us up to a year. Uh, there's lots of different challenges for these mothers. Uh, one of them is the legal side. Uh, the other one is a place to stay, accommodation. Obviously, a mother with a child that knocks in that door, the luggage is two or three children behind them. When I was out there, I didn't have anyone no one to turn to. But when I came here, I really feel the welcome. Yeah, this is a home. Even if I have to leave, still it will be her home, I can still come back. It's not easy in a different country, in a strange country. They can't even speak their own language. Uh, not having a job, ending up on the streets. And uh, when they look for help, they really they're really vulnerable to the point that they can't afford to look after their children. When you put in the middle the value, let's say the faith and love, everything goes well. And being mother, the mothers, they do understand each other. Sometimes not talking the same language, not expressing the same faith, but they do. We live together very well as Muslim, Catholic, other churches, and as human beings, and sharing the language of love. I need you to print out other one again, all right? So that you have everything. When the client is coming to you, you must know that I must give her exactly what she wants. Today we're going to do chocolate chunks cookies, ne? We need our chocolate chunks, they're on the table. We need eggs, each person will take two So eggs. the training course is a three month course. After they've completed, um, they'll graduate. And uh, if funding's available, they will each receive a starter kit in order for them then to be self-sustainable, to be out there. I think the skills uh, that we're teaching them, it's the hope for a mother. They can, maybe they can't have a job that's going to give them a salary at the end of the month and they can just relax. But at the same time that they look after their children in their own 
environment. They can do, if they take a course of baking, they can do the baking at home, they can go out and sell, and obviously that's going to contribute for them to be able to feed their family, their children. In the shelter, I'm almost a year. By the time I came, I was pregnant. I gave birth. My daughter is now seven months and she's in the baby room. I learned how to bake. And now I'm exercising myself in the baking. I'm baking and going out to sell. I come from Zimbabwe. I came because I just wanted to survive because of the economy. And then one day I met Joe, Joseph. We talked, he's a very kind man. He told me about the shelter. So I went there, 2015. That's when I learned how to sew. Thanks to the shelter, they provided me with a small machine. That's how I started. My kids, I had left them back there, but they can afford to go to school. I'm sending them money, I'm paying their school fees. Uh, they know mommy's in Joburg, surviving somehow, but it's an honest living that I'm getting. And I got it from Ben Ben Shelter. If they do the other courses as we offering, sewing, beauty, baking, addressing, it's all courses where the woman can do it in their own time. And they can do it also from small places as the rooms where they live in their own community. And we have seen results. We have seen ladies that uh, obviously they can now pay their rent, they can buy their food, they, they became independent and that gives them the hope with the dignity that they deserve. If we're trying to train the ladies, if the ladies have to go regularly to home affairs uh, to re renew the documentation, if they have to go to clinics to this, if they have to learn English, the children need a place as well, a place of uh, somewhere safe where um, the mamas know that they're well looked after. So further down the line, Mother Asunta Baby Room was opened in the crash. All teachers have had training in early childhood development and we ensure that children have uh, four meals a day. It could actually be the only meal that a child receives because we also support extremely vulnerable children from the local community. It's so nice that I'm, I'm giving a big input into somebody's life. I'm giving a big input in the children's life and in the mother's life. I'm the person who is making it possible for them to find something in life, then I'm participating to, to their kind of survival. I'm, I'm so happy. Working in Bienvenue Shelter really changed the way I see things, the way I live my life too, and the way you accept one another, which I think it's uh, something that sometimes we forget that we're meeting someone that it's just a person like you. All she needs is to be listened to.
we were founded by two very different women, Julie Billard, and then this rich aristocratic lady, Francoise Blaine de Bourdon. And Julie wanted us to be primarily about the work of education. But it wasn't only book education, it was lace making, giving women skills that could equip them to bring an income in so that they weren't totally dependent. So education broadly understood, our sisters are in community development, health education, Sister Obehi, who's a trained nurse that runs the HIV AIDS program in the Diocese of Kronstadt and works with orphans and vulnerable children and caregivers, trying to inspire them to be, as well as caring for physical needs, to bring the message, not just by preaching, but by living and showing it. So the aim is to reduce the burden that HIV and AIDS and TB places on our community and most families, hindering the children, from having their potentials because the parents, when they are sick, they are not able to fulfill their responsibility of looking after the children. So we kind of providing support to families, to guardians, to the community in order to reduce this burden that HIV and AIDS and TB and even unemployment, poverty is becoming a problem in our communities placed on children in order to achieve and attain their potentials, their education, health-wise, and also developing skills. It's a life-changing experience. When I started working from here, I didn't notice people much. I knew when someone was struggling, but I didn't have that heart. But when you are here, you learn to love more, to care for people more, to know when someone says, I'm in need of something, then you are able to go extra mile, knowing that that person it's in, real, it's in real need of that thing. With Sister Obey, it's all about love, caring for the other people, it's nothing more. Even when she, she's out there looking for funders, she will say, you must keep praying so that we are able to help those people because if she was not here, all of us won't be here. This is one of 22 centers across the diocese. They come after school, they come to do their homework, then having time to play, we offer support to their families as well. The children come from within the local community, from the township. Because you can see they are all from the black township communities. First of all, the caregivers go to this community and identify children who are vulnerable, children who are orphaned, and register them into the program. Then they are able to follow up on them, their background, they follow up on their living condition at home, they visit them, they see the, the, what condition they live in, and they are able to assess those conditions and see how we can intervene. So the children, they come um, because um, they have, some of them, they have maybe reading problems or they have difficulties with other subjects. So when they are here, we give them extra time to practice on those subjects that they are struggling with. If it's maths, then we help them with maths. If it's uh, science, then we help them. If it's reading, then we help them. Some of them, their parents, maybe they arrive late from work. So we try to push their schoolwork so that when they get home, most of the work is done. They just wash and then they rest, then prepare for the following day. When we started, we were single mothers, not having the jobs. So for us, it was a really good opportunity for us to stand on our feet. Now we have confidence, like through the trainings we got. Some of them, they come from very poor families especially we have like one uh, location. Most of them, their parents are not waiting. 
So if they eat maybe in the morning at school, then we give them food so that they don't go hungry when they get home. If there's no food, they've, they had just an afternoon meal, so it, it will balance them till they get the food again the following day at the school. The Biscuit Project is an initiative that evolved during the course of our service to the children. When we write proposals and ask for funding for international donors or within the nation, the country, uh, we sometimes are told that they don't want to spoon feed us, but rather give us a tool where we can generate income to provide food for the children. And then the ladies within the community came together, volunteered, learned how to bake the biscuits, and it's been thriving. Sister is a very good person. I was not working, then I came and volunteered, then he gave us the, the work. Now I can contribute in the house and buy the grocery, electricity. I can even go and buy clothes for my child. So it's very fun. She's a very strong woman and she always motivates us to be independent and to stand up and do things for ourselves. We can't just stay at home and say there is no work. She, she encourages us to help other people. She even encourages us to, to be confident in ourselves. When we start to volunteer, we didn't know how to speak English fluently. She teaches us, maybe we struggle with some words. She, she's a very good woman, I don't know what to say. She's many things in a good way. Over the past three years, we've been doing this biscuit project and it's been thriving very well. And I tell you, the people enjoy the biscuits because it's home baked and if they are very delicious, they always look out for them. We were called to help children of the most abandoned places. And the major thing which is in our St. Peter thing is that we spread the message of God's goodness, that God is good. And we see the goodness in each other, we offer that goodness, and we encourage the children to see the goodness in each other and to recognise the goodness and God's goodness through that. The school is over 100 years old. I've always felt that if you walk into the school, you, you must feel it's different. And I think that the fact that they live God's goodness on a daily basis, you see that in everything they do. Um, that's what we are trying to, to teach our learners, to um, make them see that it's, uh, uh, we should care for the less fortunate, we should care about others, um, we should love everyone. Uh, we don't have to always agree, but we, if we disagree, we do it in a manner of, of respect and, and with love. My role here is, first of all, the presence of, of a sister of Notre Dame to ensure that our ethos is, is followed and also to give assistance to our children and to the parents. Many of them come from very difficult circumstances. Many of the children don't come from, shall I say, normal homes with a father and a mother. Many of them are brought up by um, other relatives like a grandparent or aunt. Well, the Sisters of Notre Dame influence me very strong and positively because they encourage us to do the best always. And they don't just teach us about school things or something. They also teach us about life in general. We originally started with the normal government curriculum that's been offered by all public schools. Um, however, at a later stage, we, um, from the board side and the owner side, uh, a decision was made that we should rather look at a more challenging curriculum for our learners, especially to help them with tertiary applications to universities, etc. So we introduced the um, IEB um, curriculum. Um, in 2014, we started um, with our grade 10 group. And in 2016 was the first time that we wrote the, the IEB metric. Many fall down and break apart because of pain. The pain we get 
from our mistakes. We do not realize this, but we are in a chain. A chain that will make us change. Become new people, enter in a new stage. Many will lose, some will gain. Believe, young person, that you'll be great. There will be better days. I hope you remember these words and have faith. I hope you'll acknowledge my words and pray. There is a group of sisters we are collaborating with, and those are the sisters of St. Bridget. They wear green. And the sisters of the companions of St. Angela, they wear black and white, and the sisters of Calvary. So we call ourselves ABC, Angela, Bridget, and Calvary. We work closely with each other. We are a congregation of the Assassin Right, we, we, are, we say, which was founded in 1958 and is called the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Bridget. The mission of the congregation was for the sisters to teach when, you remember when apartheid started, they were worried that they would close the Catholic school that was there and they hoped that the Sisters of St. Bridget would take over as teachers but they also had a hospital. So our main work was nurses and nursing and teaching. And then later we had pastoral work and then we have social because now I work as a psychologist, not as a teacher. So we, we got it to be also social um, teachings and social work. The Companions of St. Angela is a religious con a congregation of diocesan right that was founded by Archbishop Patrick Whelan, who was an oblate. And the reason for him founding us was that um, it was during the Group Eras Act. You remember the apartheid era? Um, he felt that, or he, from what was happening around the country, there was this whole concern that was coming up that um, white sisters might not be able to enter the townships anymore because they were the ones rendering the services within the township at that time. So the bishop felt mm, there might be a need to have African sisters who would minister to their own sisters. And that's how we were founded as a congregation. And we might not have that apartheid anymore today, but we find that within our communities, there's this whole scourge of young people and drugs, you find, uh, I don't want to call them broken families, but you find um, young people without, well, I'll call them absent fathers in a way. I work a lot with young people, and this is where it would come out where they would, you know, kind of cry out to their, to their, to their missing uh, parents. And you see a lot of the challenges that we have in society arising out of um, this whole brokenness that we have uh, within our families. So we might not have apartheid, but we have a different kind of um, social ill that's eating away at our society, which still makes the Companions of St. Angela uh, relevant to our day and time. I'll give you the example of what we have been doing recently with the help of the Sisters of Botswana. They came out, we invited them to come out, and they gave me four young sisters and we said we are planting the seed for vocations. We are not promoting vocations per se, but we are planting the seed. When we went to one school, and I said to them, because the time wasn't enough, and I said to them, okay, I'm taking the reading from uh, uh, Exodus, the call of Moses. And the question I asked them was, what does taking off your shoes mean? And they said to me, it's respect. 
And because of the way even the way, then I said, then you are holy ground. You know, that's what a holy ground symbolizes. You are the holy ground. So if anybody wants to put you into drugs or make you do something that's not right, you can say, take off your shoes, meaning respect me. We are trying to get into families to see how we can help uh, the young people in the families because we believe that these young people are the ones who are going to be leaders of tomorrow, leaders of the society, people who are going to be priests and sisters and we are working together with parents how to try to mold our children. And that as I was talking about drugs, it's something that we are, we don't know where to start at the moment, but it's something which is really destroying our young people. We are talking about it. I hope it won't take long because if it takes long, if the discussion takes long, we will lose a lot of young people. Today, the sisters are found in almost every continent, most of the islands, and uh, engage in a variety of work, but mainly it has a social impact and uh, mainly teaching, healthcare, and social events or social help for people in need. The sisters initially came to Mexicang, Mexicang as we pronounce it, uh, in 18. Uh, 97 and then they came to Johannesburg in 1930. Their influence has been absolutely enormous over the years. Um, we have a very strong ethos, we have a very strong moral foundation. Our five values, compassion, striving for excellence, responsibility to others, community, cooperation in the community and these are dotted all over the school. Being a Catholic school and an independent school, um, diversity is nothing new. Um, the Catholic Church and the sisters themselves have been very much involved with transformation right before apartheid. Um, Catholic schools were actually um, part of that transformation, bringing in people of colour. So our school has been diverse for many, many years, for decades. Um, and so the girls are very used to uh, the, you know, having children from diverse culture, diverse religion, and diverse, obviously, um, colour. We love to integrate people. We're not discriminated at all. Like, we embrace everyone from all races and all cultural backgrounds. It's, it's something that we really take pride into. And um, it's been such an incredible experience to surround myself with different dynamic beings. And it's, it's you know, we learn like that. And it's really, really awesome to just grow through other people. Being called Rosies, which is obviously the symbol of Rosebank, we always say to girls when we're talking about it, are you being a Rosie? Um, and they know immediately that we are referring back to the values and the ethos that the sisters laid down for us. In 2015, one of the staff members um, was keen to start with a new project 
We knew we wanted to do a Saturday school and being in education it just made sense for us also to do that. And um, one of her colleagues was working in a public school in Parktown and it just seemed like a good relationship to have at the time to include some learners that we could enrich. One thing that people struggle with today is not knowing where to go to give back to community service. Um, so the fact that we've brought it into the school really provides girls with the ideal opportunity to give back and to do as much as they possibly can. One of the big things about St. Teresa's is helping girls specifically with education. So just the idea of helping girls to learn, helping girls go further in the world because of the education they have has been really big for me. And knowing that I'm helping people, helping these wonderful kids just have a better chance, it's amazing. You can see the progress every single weekend you come here. You teach these girls English, um, math, they are taking these lessons and they're bringing them home, they're applying them to their daily lives, so it makes you feel like you're actually doing something. Because it's, you're truly changing a child's life because they are growing up, growing up in schools where they don't really care because there's so many kids, they can't pay attention to everybody. So now we're going to give them their individual attention, make them, make them feel special, and it always makes me feel good. There's a special empathy in the school that you won't find anywhere, well, in Mercy schools, that you don't find in other schools. And people say to us when they walk through the gates, there's something different here, but it's not tangible. They can't feel it. And it's, it's that compassion and that love of looking after somebody else and caring for somebody else is what the sisters really, really gave to us. Faith without action, it's uh, an empty gong that sounds uh, like a barrel, empty barrel. I mean, if I say I have faith and I say, oh, be, it is well with you, without actually reaching out and doing something, it has meant nothing. So the gospel values that we have learned over the years through our formations is to put our faith into action, irrespective of who the person is, of what religion, religious background or person is, cultural background, it doesn't matter as far as we are all children of God and we are created in the image and likeness of God, God is asking me to reach out to that person because there is a purpose for God calling me to live this kind of life. And if I haven't reached or touched any life during my lifetime of saying that I am uh, living this calling of serving God's people, then I would be living a life of life. Well, to be still here, all of us, is because of our belief in Jesus. If we didn't have that, I'm sure we'd have long called it a day. So we feel called and you can't say you are called if you don't have faith in believing that somebody is calling you. Being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, it's not just coming to church on Sunday and saying a lot of prayers. It's much more, it's walking the talk. It's trying to walk the talk. It's trying to show by your life. For me, even in the most difficult circumstances, to keep believing and living and knowing the goodness of God. When people don't have faith and when they feel hopeless, um, and it's our responsibility as Christians, it's our responsibility as religious to, to not only bring hope, but to be people of hope. Um, it can be overwhelming with all what we see around us. A faith has played a well, a predominant role in my life, really. Uh, I have never wavered from the faith. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. I know on who I am grounded. And I would say every day 
my faith comes into play. If there are issues to be dealt with, I always go back to saying, what's the, what was the take of Jesus on this point? And so faith uh, is the ground of my being, really, I would say. If faith give me hope, give me strength to continue. If I have no that faith in my life, uh, easy I can uh, go back, be sad, feel lonely. Um, of course, but the faith keep myself to be strong with courage and keep going the beautiful work that God put in our hands now to do. It plays a vital role in my life because when I don't know what to do anymore, I just rely on my faith. And I know that I'll be out of that situation, whatever difficulty I face. And I just say to God, then, here I am and I can't do anything, but with you, I rely on your promises, I rely on your weight, and I know that the situation will be what you want it to be.